Uh, this event has come about because, um, well, it was started because of the wonderful paintings that Lisa Milroy is uh, offered to Gallery North for, for this month, um, which obviously we are very excited about. Uh, there are going to be public tours of the exhibition, so anybody you know who would have liked to have been here today uh, but who is going to miss the event, as well as eventually being able to hopefully see it on the archive, they can join one of these tours because our interns are going to act as ambassadors and carry uh, the uh, ideas and concerns that Lisa has transmitted to them um, and, uh, and, and lead these tours. So I think they'll be quite an exciting new venture for Gallery North. We're also going to have school tours. So obviously um, for Gallery North, this is a fantastic um, opportunity uh, to involve younger um, members of the public. Um, I'm delighted that you've all managed to get here today. I know it's going to be a really exciting afternoon. And I'd like to particularly thank Mr. Milroy, but also the Slade School staff who are here, Joe Volley, Anya McCausland, who are going to talk to you later on, uh, our own Jean Brown, who's going to talk to you, and uh, particularly the members of staff from Helsinki, and that's Taya, Mala, and Rika, who are uh, going to pronounce their second names for you <laughs> later on, because I'm pretty hopeless at that. Uh, so I'd just like to say welcome to you all, and to pass over to Lisa, who's going to give a short blessing. Thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for that very warm and generous welcome, and it's a great pleasure to um, be able to um, install my paintings in the beautiful Gallery North. And so thank you very much, Helen, for the invitation. And very excited to um, have the opportunity this afternoon to work together with um, with Northumbria, the Slade, where um, I, I work, and Helsinki. It's a fantastic opportunity to, um, to um, investigate um, uh, the subject of black, and um, to build on our interest in our materials research projects. And so to begin this afternoon, Helen has invited me to read an essay I wrote for, um, for this exhibition, and so that's what I'm going to do. Um, as, you, as you know, the show is entitled Ivory, Lamp, Mars, Vine, Bone. Lack has played a significant role in my practice since I began painting still lifes in the early 1980s. I used black formally in depictions of shadow, surface, and space, but I also feature it for its own material presence as a rich fluid line, a chalky madness, a viscous surface, a glaze, a delicate wash. Objects, rooms, buildings, landscapes, a person, the motifs in my paintings are defined first by light and shadow. Descriptive elements particular to the subject follow. Light and shadow make space within a space for my subjects. Light and shadow give the depicted object weight and ballast, keying its interiority. Equally, they bring out its surface qualities, its exteriority. Light and shadow are the living counterparts to the abstracts of black and white. The subjects in my paintings are much more detailed than their corresponding shadows. That's to say, the form of a shadow doesn't correspond precisely to the shape of its subject. Yet the viewer understands perfectly that this particular shadow belongs to this particular thing. A shadow remains from the first shadow that I painted. It's become a fixture, a constant, like the beam from a lighthouse or my own shadow. I can't remember painting this first shadow, but it's as if I've been painting the same shadow ever since. It's as if the same play of light and shadow infuses all my paintings, no matter when they were painted. Light and shadow grow out of that single instance, painted again and again, each new painting escaping while embodying the past, becoming entirely of the present. Through painting, I can tip or steady, explore the balance between the familiar and unfamiliar, the ordinary and extraordinary. A, si a significant painting for me is Shoes, painted in 1986, which is in the Tate collection. 
12 pairs of black court shoes presented in different positions and composed in a grid across the canvas. This black shoe has followed me through time, appearing over the years in numerous paintings. The black of the shoe and its attendant black shadow, in my mind, each offers a different, separate experience linked to the act of painting. The shoe is tangible, factual, ordinary. The shadow is suggested, felt, mysterious. This relation can be inverted when the black of a shoe acts as a negative, a void, and the shadow is read matter-of-factly as a sign. In my paintings, the shoe and shadow act as a metaphor for painting itself, painting as both something to do and something to look at, and both embody and picture the wonder of how the dumb material stuff of paint can be mysteriously transformed through an imaginative process into an object that has the potential to touch the viewer. Through painting the shoe shadow, I tap into a powerful feeling triggered by a sense of the present and past, life and death, loss and becoming. All the imagery in my paintings is fed by the conceptual understanding and emotional energy to be found in the shoe and shadow. Perhaps all black in my paintings stems from my shadow, painted in real, whether the lively surface of a shiny black shoe or the spatial blackness of a darkened room. I've always imagined the light source in my paintings issuing from the left. Perhaps this is due to the mind-body experience of reading, left to right, with the light source usually to my left or above me. Or perhaps it's linked to being right-handed, the shadow of my hand falling to the right as I move it across the page, keeping the writing well lit while avoiding ink or graphite smudges. While shadows are nearly always present in my paintings, the light sources that produce them are rarely depicted. I mostly make my own black paint by mixing ultramarine blue and burnt umber oil paint. I only use black straight out of the tin for painting a ground, or as a glaze, or for drawing on the canvas when I need a line both fluid and pigment rich. Emotionally, it feels quite different to use ready-made black as opposed to the black I make myself. My own black feels more intimate, somehow a part of me, an extension. Ready-made black is more a tool, functional. Independent from me, ready-made black paint is less emotionally charged. In my paintings, I need a combination of both. The darkest area in my painting is the point at which the object and ground meet in shadow. Darkest does not always mean black, although this dark can feel like black. Shadows in my paintings bind objects to the ground. My shadows are a mix of ultramarine, ultramarine blue, burnt umber and titanium white which produces a soft dark gray. For a warm or hot shadow, I add to the mix a touch of yellow or yellow ochre or alizarin crimson, and for a cooler shadow, I add more ultramarine blue. <coughs> to paint a shadow, I start by brushing my own black paint to the right of the object, and then paint the dark gray component <coughs> next to it. I blend the black at the edge of the object into the gray area and the gray area into the off-white ground that surrounds the object. I usually paint wet on wet to easily merge one zone into the other. Image-wise, the shadow has three distinct zones gathered into a single cohesive unit. The mind knows there are three zones, but the eye sees them as a totality. Or perhaps it's the other way around. The eye sees three distinct elements but the mind fuses them as one. At any rate, it's difficult to discern where one zone stops and the other begins. The divisions are blurred. When it comes to drawing, my favorite drawing material is compressed charcoal. Whether hard, medium, or soft, what I love about charcoal is its density. I enjoy the physicality of working with a charcoal stick rubbing, dusting, smudging, feathering, erasing, 
or grinding it into the paper to build up a surface, a presence. The insistent black powder stays under my fingernails for days. While I draw, the blackness that emerges on a sheet of paper <coughs> is so captivating that it becomes an experience in itself, detached from the job of description. In looking at a charcoal drawing, I grow aware of the line in relation to the worked in areas, such as shadows or the background. The same stick of charcoal gives rise to two different experiences. Line gives me a sense of control, structure, and definition, which triggers the pleasure found in order. Worked in areas stir up a feeling of wildness, of being out of control, nervousness, even fear. Maybe these worked in areas elicit an ancient bod body memory of mark making and the central engagement with stuff that comes before learning to speak or read and write. For me, the line and worked in areas, worked in area key notions of meaningfulness and meaninglessness. In 2004, when a geisha in my series of geisha paintings died, or at least pretended to, the intense black of compressed charcoal surfaced in my mind as an ideal expression of mourning. I devised a paint equivalent to charcoal by mixing black powder pigment and acrylic medium into a paste, which I rubbed onto the canvas with a cloth. Once applied, the black acted as a ground while simultaneously depicting space. In subsequent oil paintings, this powdery black morphed into a dark atmosphere inhabited by memories. It became a space where the past mixed with the present, and I used it in such paintings of movie screens of projectors projecting a film, of projectors projecting slides onto screens, and in paintings of vases encased in vitrines. So over the years, I've held a fascination for the subject of absence and presence, for things that can be seen yet remain unknown or inaccessible, and for the relation between the material and immaterial. I find visual depictions of opacity, translucency, and transparency beautiful. In my paintings, black and white comprise the visual, conceptual, and emotional register from which I explore this ongoing fascination. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. That looks fantastic. Uh, I'm sure it's given us all an awful lot to think about, um, and that will come out. You'll have an opportunity at the end of uh, today for a question and answer se session. Um, so the next two visitors I'm delighted to um, welcome. Uh, Joe Bolly and Anya McCausland, and they're going to talk to you about some research that's been going on at Slade School. And um, this is uh, research that uh, has fantastic opportunities for us um, to uh, find out about the colour. Thank you. Right. Thank you for that introduction, and I, I'm, I'm going to, I really am going to. Uh, talk to you about what we're doing at the Slade in relation to our material research project. But, but to do that, I, I have to go back. Um, as a way of background, uh, I'd like to go back to the 12th of January uh, 2010 to a, a Slade research presentation forum, where by way of introduction to my work, I described how my love, um, um, my love of matter, the stuff of stuff, had led me to work with a fairly wide range of materials and how over the years this involvement has become increasingly fundamental to my work process and the form of the work. When involved in making and looking at art, it's not so much the why or the idea that really excites me and engages my senses, but how that is done, how is it done, and what is it made of. A great deal of my studio time involves the investigation of methods and materials which are central to my practice and increasingly important to my teaching. I spend, I spend a considerable time preparing sample boards of surfaces, testing binders for pigments, animal and synthetic glues, updating and adjusting recipes. I have a rather fine collection of, um, of oak apples, 
but rather the raw material that create the tannin for uh, the basis of iron gall ink, which is something I feel... Now, I've never seen an oak apple that thing like that. It's <laughs> fantastic. Um, In your dreams. Yeah, yeah. well, yes, a as, absolutely. <clears throat> Uh, this, uh, uh, gosh, this is a very small painting um, using uh, iron gall, iron gall ink, uh, iron gall ink on gesso. So I'm just going to literally go through a few, just so you get an idea of what I do as an artist. Can we ask you questions uh, as you go? Is that okay? Um, I think I'd rather at the end yeah, because I sort okay. of, I sort of present, presented this in a rather formal way. I feel like okay, that's good. But these are just some works that are using uh, different, um, particularly iron gall ink and different inks that I've, I've made. This is for a much larger work called Coast. Um, maybe I should paint them that big. Um, that evening I also spoke of an ambition I shared with my colleagues to have a fully equipped and functioning investigative methods and materials laboratory that will provide students with a place solely intended for the preparation, preparing of canvases and surfaces, making of grounds, and where inquiries and testing into various materials could be made. I felt it was increasingly evident student engagement and understanding with material knowledge was neglected by, by the school, not, not the students. When I was a student at the Slade in the 70s, Arthur Lucas, chief curator, conservator at the National Gallery, came in about once a week and gave technical talks and demonstrations in the methods and materials room, which was located in the basement. This facility was lost in the early 90s during a restructuring program, and this lack of facility created a lack of opportunity, advice and support in the understanding of material and their relationship with technical matters. With my colleagues Gary Woodley and Ed Allington, we began a series of technical talks and demonstrations on a wide range of issues that stemmed out of our practice and created by student interest. There was the occasional visitor, like Robin Pender, um, who was a wall painting conservator for English heritage, who would come and demonstrate on um, fresco painting. Uh, it was always a, a great favourite, um, even though nobody actually ever makes a fresco afterwards. Great shame. But I tell, you, I tell you all of this so that you will understand a small revolution has occurred at Slade. Up until Lisa Miroy's arrival in September 2009, little support had been given for the study of painting materials or facilities for their preparation. In sculpture, there are the workshops within print and electronic media, equipment and technical sport, sport, support. It was as if somehow painters came to the school all fully ready and fully equipped. We needed to restore a place for demonstrations and technical talks, somewhere to house equipment and materials, somewhere to contain a library of samples, recipes and procedures. I like the idea of being a meeting place for discussion and an interchange of ideas. A place to promote ideas relating to the understanding and exploration of materials, methods and the techniques available to the painter. Gary and I had dreamed up and made plans for a mobile workstation that would in its final form, to, to quote Gary, encapsulate the necessity and function of a fully equipped contemporary artist studio in all the guises that entails. I thought of it as a manifesto that would pay attention to the action of making and reaffirm the status and understanding involved in the craft of painting. I also wanted to create a database, an archive, a way of cataloging materials and methods that would be an ongoing, updated access and accessed by the web. It would be candid. A way of information could be imparted and built upon. The historic, the known alongside the new and the innovative a place for hidden and what would become possibly lost knowledge. This time last year, I was speaking at yet another forum. We, we do a lot of that at the Slade. It was called Material Culture, and I was updating the progress of the methods room and introducing one of its most precious and valued assets, Anya McCausland. Anya is the first Honorary Research Assistant for Grad Painting. This position signifies a great shift <coughs> in the thinking. Since then, we have developed the Materials Research Project. It strives to spearhead the role of materials within the creative, creative process and create a culture of inquiry and, the possibilities, and its possibilities. 
we attempt to encompass the richness of approaches to painting and all its manifestations. This is the, this was it then, how pure that looked. Um, I looked a bit tired, I just painted it out with Anya <laughs> and Lisa. Uh, the methods room, we're in the present now. The methods room is now a permanent site for students and staff to experiment with materials, sorry, to experiment with materials, sharing discoveries and engaging in discussion. It is situated physically and I feel symbolically at the heart of the graduate painting and welcomes staff and students across the school. Well, more, almost all of them. Um, so that's a bit more updated, you see. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the materials research project has three strands. Um, the first one is guided exploration, which includes testing new ways of developing the relationship between image and material. There are regular talks and seminars on a wide range of materials related subjects such as the properties of industrial paints and varnishes. Um, this would be a typical um, notice that Anya would put up early in the week for people to come or to go on the web, so to invite people to uh, <coughs> search into this, this subject. Uh, this is Anya's first, I think this is your first tour on pigment and binders. Oh yeah, yeah. Looking a bit nervous. <laughs> this is Gary Woodley, um, who's giving a talk on um, drawing instruments and ways of setting um, our projection. There he is. That's Gary. <laughs> 